I've titled this lecture, The Spade Unearths the Truth. Here is a Time magazine front page which asks the question, is the Bible fact or fiction? And archaeologists in the Holy Land are shedding new light on tales of the scriptures and what did and didn't happen. You know, the Bible is under tremendous attack from what we call higher critics. These are people who believe that they can take the Bible and use certain portions as allegories and other portions they can discard with impunity. Either the Bible has validity in our time or it is just a book of myths. If so, well then it can be compared with something like good literature at most. Many people have Bibles. The Bible often stands on a shelf as the most sold book in the world and sadly often the most unread book in the world. Some people use it as a doorstop. Some people believe that only certain portions of the Bible are applicable. Sometimes I'd like to give them a big pair of scissors and say, why are you carrying such a heavy Bible? Cut it in half and only carry the bits that you need and then, you know, get rid of the rest. Is that so, or is it not so? Or does the whole Bible have something for all of us? What does it tell us about the God of the Bible, for example? What is the Bible all about? Voltaire, who was the philosopher, if you like, of the French Revolution, said, I am tired of hearing people repeat that 12 men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man may suffice to overthrow it. Well, was he successful? In the very place where he stood and spoke these words, today there is one of the greatest Bible depositories in the world. It's kind of ironical that he is part of the dust of the world, but the Bible still carries on. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Well, we have a sure word of prophecy, and we would do well if we were to take heed of what it says. It's very important that we understand what the Bible is trying to tell us. Today, there are so many winds of doctrines out there as to what the Bible supposedly says, but does everybody actually look at the text word for word and actually reads what it says? Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Isaiah 42, verse 9. You know, there are people out there that so glibly say, God doesn't have foreknowledge. Things just happen. Well, this text clearly says, if you read it as it stands, that God tells you ahead of time what will happen on this planet. He doesn't leave us orphans. He tells us ahead of time. But here's an interesting thing that he tells us as well. He says, behold, the former things are come to pass. In other words, if you don't believe me that I can predict the future, God is saying, then check out the past. Because before it happened in the past, I'd said it in the Bible, and you can check out the past to see if you can trust my word about the future. Isn't that what it's saying? I think so. So tonight I want to do that. I want to jump into the past and I want to see whether God is true to his word. Isaiah 46 verse 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, 
For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That's quite a challenge. Did you know that there is no other religious book in the entire world that has such a challenge? Not one. Not one. You can go to any of them. Why not? Because they cannot foretell the future and hand out a challenge and say, see if it is so. Check me out. God is challenging the world to make a comparison. So Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, throw out a challenge which no other religious book in the world can equal or dare to copy or even try to copy. John 5 verse 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now when Jesus spoke these words, only the Old Testament existed. In other words, he is telling us that the Old Testament testifies of Jesus Christ. Isn't it strange that today people say, well, we don't need the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament was so different to the God that we have learned to know and come to love in the New Testament that we don't need that Old Testament anyway. But, yeah, the Bible clearly says that the whole Bible is about a person. It is about a person. It is about Jesus Christ. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses. That's the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And in the prophets, that's all the prophetic books. And in the Psalms. So there you have the whole Old Testament concerning me. Wow. Wow. So the whole Bible, the Old Testament, was a book concerning Jesus Christ. So yes, it is a book of salvation. But the Bible makes claims like no others. It also claims to be a book of origins. It tells us where we come from, that we have a noble beginning, that we were made in the image of God. It tells us that there is a battle between good and evil. The Bible tells us that there was a war which caused a great calamity which started in heaven and is being raged and waged right here on this earth. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that the God of heaven has intervened once before and destroyed the entire world with a flood. Now isn't it fascinating? that 90% of the world's population does not believe that. 90% of the world's population refuses to accept what the Bible says in the book of Genesis. That is why we took some time and presented these evolution creation lectures to show that the Bible really means what it says and that the arrogance of man has reduced those first books of the Bible to nothing and is prepared to throw them into the scrap heap. Don't mess with God's Word. So the Bible is a book of origins. It tells us where we come from. It is a book about salvation. It is a book about a person. And that person, according to these scriptures, is Jesus Christ. And then there's one other thing about the Bible that is amazing. It is a historic book. And here the field critics have a field time. The higher critics say, oh, this didn't happen and that didn't happen and this and that and the other was not so, it was so. And they believe that they have a better grasp on history than the Bible, although they didn't live at that time when this word was already alive. But besides that, have they proved have they been proved right over the years? Or have they been proved wrong? What do you think? Every single time that the spade unearths something in the archaeological world, 
the Bible is vindicated and the so-called enlightened people of the world are proved wrong. Every single time. So let's go to Egypt and see where the critics of the world have the most fun. And let's take the very heart of the scriptures in terms of archaeology and let's take the most difficult passages where archaeology has come to the forefront with some amazing discoveries but the critics have a totally different story. And let's compare. Let's go to Egypt. These are the step pyramids of Saqqara and these were the oldest ones. Step pyramids of Saqqara, Pharaoh Sosa, 3rd dynasty, 2750 BC. Amazing. If we went into the past, those dates would have been much, much older. But these are the dates that are accepted in the world today. There's a story in the Bible about Joseph. Oh, it's an allegory, they say. An allegory, just a tale of a young man who went to Egypt and then through circumstances suddenly was uplifted to be second in command in the whole of Egypt. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand, we read in the book of Genesis. We read in the book of Genesis that the young man became a counselor to Pharaoh himself. Now the Semitic Hyksos ruled from 1780 to 1545 BC, and it's quite possible that the young Semite then could have reached such ascendancy. Is there any truth in the story that a Pharaoh consulted a young Hebrew man? Genesis chapter 41, verse 28 to 30, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land, but seven years of famine will follow them. That's what the Bible says, what happened in the history. And then came archaeology and found an inscription on the first cataract of the Nile, which read, I collected corn, I was watching in times of sowing, and when a famine arose, lasting many years, I distributed corn. The Nile has not overflowed for a period of seven years. Herbage fails, the storehouses were built, all that was in them has been consumed. Archaeology and the Bible. So this cataract on the Nile tells us that something like this really happened in Egypt. Then there are interesting um, drawings and sculptures in the tombs. Here's a typical tomb, and if you look on the left side over there, there's a cow with the ribs sticking out. And on this side, here is a cow that is round and plump. So stories of fat cows and lean cows abound in the archaeology of Egypt. The greatest story, however, concerning Egypt is the story of the Exodus. Now, imagine the story. Here is a story of God intervening in the lives of the Egyptians and the Hebrew nation and of God taking a whole nation of slaves out from under the nose of Pharaoh, taking them up to the Red Sea, opening up the Red Sea. They march right through to, to the other side. Pharaoh and his entire army follow in hot pursuit and are destroyed in the Red Sea, and the whole of Egypt lies in tatters after having been hit by ten plagues. Nice story, right? Anything written down in the history of Egypt to substantiate it? No. So what do you think the higher critics would say about a story like that? Obviously it's an allegory, it's a nice little story, that has been made up to show how powerful the God of the Hebrew is, or is compared to the other gods. That's all it is. Or is it? What does the evidence really say? Well, let's go and have a look. You see, the Egyptians were notorious for only recording their victories. Pharaohs that had been in wars, many of them, like Ramesses, for example, that fought against the Hyksos and he got licked and then goes and depicts his great victories in the archaeological past. Isn't that great? 
when he got licked? Well, the Egyptians were, I always say, much like the Russians. You know, when the Russians had their early space program and something went wrong in space and one of their spacecraft with all their cosmonauts exploded in space, then after a little while you would get a cryptic message. We have successfully tested an explosive device in space. That's all you'd hear. And then the rest would sort of come filtering out that there really had been a disaster. Well, so were the Egyptians. They would not record their failures in stone. Only their victories. And you must understand their mindset. After all, Pharaoh was a reincarnation of the sun god. That's what he was. He was a reincarnation of the sun god. He was infallible. How could he make a mistake? Everything he touched turned to gold. Nothing went wrong. So how could they record things that went wrong? They just didn't. But tonight we want to play Sherlock Holmes. We want to go into the past and play Sherlock Holmes. Let's go to the pyramids. Close to the pyramids, over here, you have the Sphinx. When I shall make the land of Egypt desolate, and the country shall be destitute of that with, whereof it was full. Ezekiel 32, 15. The Bible says there was something wrong in the past with Egypt, and there will be something wrong in the future as well. Here's an interesting article that came from Time magazine. A figurine backs the tale of Moses and the idolatrous Israelites. The worship of the golden calf, which was part of the Egyptian worship system. The apis bull. Well, today, nobody criticizes these facts anymore. In the past, they were greatly criticized. Oh, there was no worship of a bull. What nonsense. Did you know that the world today still worships the bull and that you have holy cows that are worshipped as deities to this very day? Just go to, eat, to India and you'll see that you may not touch any of the holy cows. They can walk through the cities. You can do nothing about them. Apis worship is not dead, not even to this very day. And their symbolism is very interesting. Serpents with wings. That's reminiscent of something that is written in the scriptures. They even have covering serpent cherubs on either sides of structures on their altars. Now, this is very interesting. The Bible tells us that Lucifer was a covering cherub and that he wanted to be like the Most High. Yeah, they use serpents as covering cherubs and they have red dots, suns, sun worship, above them. Isis and Osiris were the chief deities of Egypt in various forms over the ages. So here we have Isis, the female aspect of the deity, and Osiris, the male aspect of the deity. Isis and Osiris had a son. His name was Horus. Horus, the savior of the world. So we have a sort of mini story about a savior coming from a male and a female deity. In Christianity and in the Bible, we also have the story of a Messiah who is born of God and a woman, but who is an earthly, normal woman, except that she conceived as a virgin here, Isis also apparently conceived as a virgin. So the mythology that we have over there smacks of some things that we find in the Bible, except that the Bible accurately predicts the very time in which the Messiah would come, down to the letter. Wow, there is no other book that does that. In the Egyptian mythology, when you died, you were greeted by another form of Osiris, then as the god of the dead, Anubis, who would weigh your deeds in a scale, and if you were found wanting, well then you did not make it into the good place, but you went to the bad place. So here is a religion of works, where your works are weighed in the balances and either found acceptable or not. And Anubis was the deity that was worshipped 
this form of Osiris. In fact, it is the worship of the God of the dead. But the Bible says, Jesus says, I am not the God of the dead, I am the God of the living. There's something very interesting about that. And here you have another uh, deity, where you have the serpents on either sides. This is a depiction of Hathor, which is just another form of depicting the bull. And then you had all kinds of mythological birds. If you have, for example, this one over here with this eagle's head, that's a symbol of Horus. Here standing opposite Anubis, who is Osiris. And in actual fact, Horus is Osiris because Horus is the reincarnation of Osiris who died. And so we can have the whole mythology there packed into the story. Isis, here's a big Isis temple. Isis was the favorite female deity of Egypt. The great pyramids were nothing really other than tombs of the early pharaohs. Later they buried them in burial chambers hewn into solid rock. And these pyramids have a story to tell. Well, during the French occupation, a French soldier happened to kick out the stone that was known as the Rosetta Stone. And on it there were three languages. And only since the French Revolution, really, since those times, have we the capacity to start to understand these languages. This is the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum at the moment. And a man by the name of Champollion took over 20 years to decipher the hieroglyphics. So really, we can only read what happened in the past in the stones since about 100 years. That's it. Science of archaeology is only about 100 years old. And the critics have been screaming about the Bible since the Middle Ages. And only in the last hundred years, we're actually very privileged, privileged time, have these things been revealed to us. Well, the, the ancients believed that life continued after death, and mummies were an attempt to preserve that life. When you were buried, you were buried with uh, all your paraphernalia so that you could continue the life on the other side. When pharaohs died, very often their entire staff was killed so that he would have someone to serve him on the other side. It was a dangerous job, I'll tell you that. You took care of your pharaoh, because at the end of the day, that was it, you know. You went to sleep at the same time. And so we have these magnificent stories on the rocks. Here are some great pharaohs that are depicted, and they're always depicted as mightier than man. They are unconquerable. And wherever you see these needles, these obelisks, they are a representation of, well, how do I put this mildly, the male gender. You see, when Osiris died, Isis put him back together again, but he was missing a part which she then reconstructed so that she could bear Horus, and that's it, over there. So actually, wherever we see those symbols, it's not a very nice thing to behold. So it is a form of what we call phallic worship, because the power of man lies in his capacity to generate. So that which you bring forth makes you like God, so they believed in a sense that they were God, and some were just a little bit more God than others. Pharaoh on his um, chariot raging across the plains. I mean, they had some amazing things in those days. This one here, here, this goat, was a depiction of the god Amun. Goat worship throughout history is an incredible part of the occult world. Did you know that goat worship today is alive and well and thriving in the United States of America? Did you know that? Well, just go to one of the secret fraternities that abound in your country and also in the southern states. Go to Oklahoma and uh, virtually the whole state is run by goat worshippers. 
Well, we'll come to that when we deal with secret societies. If you go to uh, Egypt today and you come to the famous, famous temples that still abound, and this is Luxor, you will see the beautiful hieroglyphics. And here's an interesting hieroglyphics because it, it reads the same forward as it reads backwards. Originally you would read them backwards, but you could read them forwards and backwards. Here's the ankh in the middle, and uh, there is a blade, and there is an insect, and so you could read this message uh, this way or that way. Or you could make a little joke, you see, because everything was a symbol of what actually existed. If you had to anthropomorphize this into English, you could say be leaf, belief in the Ankh eternal life. Something like that. That's how you would basically read it. They also worshipped strange creatures, like this one, for example, was very sacred, and uh, we would have to understand the mindset of, as to why something like the scarab beetle, which is a dung beetle, was worshipped with great honor. Now, why worship a dung beetle? Well, you see, they were pantheists. Pantheism teaches that God is in everything, including in us, and we are part of that deity. And in regeneration, in the sexual production of life, therein lies our power of godhood. That is what they believe. And therefore, how much more so a dung beetle that turns excrement, that which is discarded back into the beauty of a scarab beetle is a symbol of the regeneration of life. So it is a symbol of life from death and power and divinity within all of us. Pantheism is alive and well and living in your country and every other country in the world today. The whole New Age movement is based on pantheism. Amazing symbols that we find are these over here, for example, the circle with the cross in them. You will find this symbol in more places than you might believe. You might be surprised where you find it, or the eye of Osiris, or these mythological birds. Well, here are some interesting features about pharaohs, large giant statues, and uh, typical, the male was the ultimate. And here you have a pharaoh, and you see the female renegated to a spot over there between his legs. Nothing too much about that. Now let's get to this famous story of the Exodus. Is this a true story or is it a mythology? Here you have the famous Ramesses II. Notice again that his females are nothing more than knee high. Not much there. And this was a basically male dominated male power society. Do we have secret societies today that are male dominated? Yes or no? Oh yes. Do we have religious societies that are male dominated? Yes. Very interesting. But uh, Ramesses lived in a time which was basically biblically too late for the Exodus. But if you look at the popular notion, what do you find? You will find that they say this was the pharaoh of the Exodus. Ramesses was the pharaoh of the Exodus. And who watched the film uh, Moses, the animated film Moses? Anybody watch it here? I mean, it was very popular and it was on the screens. Who was the pharaoh of the Exodus in that film? Ramesses. Ramesses. Well, that's not biblical. It could not have been Ramesses. Ramesses was far too late. Is it possible that by choosing Ramesses they want to hide something? Maybe because during the time of Ramesses, pharaohs were again in such a position that women were again knee-high. There was stability of the ancient religion of Egypt in the time of Ramesses. Did you know that there was a major hiccup in the religion of Egypt? before the time of Ramesses? Wow, what happened over there? Well, let's go and have a look at the story of Moses. Moses apparently was placed onto the Nile. 
in a little boat of reeds and sent out onto the Nile. And uh, he was probably called Hapi Moses as a reference to the Nile God. He was born in 1530 BC. According to the chronology in the Bible, he was born in 1530 BC. He also fled in 1490 BC. Remember we worked backwards in BC, so you can't count forward, you have to count the other way around. Uh, so 1530, he was 40 years old when he fled, so that makes it 1490 BC. And if you take the chronology in the book of Kings, where it tells you exactly when, for example, Solomon reigned, and exactly how long after the Exodus he reigned, and we have perfect dates for that, then you can actually work out exactly, according to the Bible, when that Exodus took place. And the date that you get from that is Exodus uh, took place on the 17th of March, 1450. That's what the Bible says. That's not what the world says. The Bible says this. And is this accepted as a date? Absolutely. It's taken up in giant concordances of the Bible in all over the world. This is a very scholarly date as well. Now, was there a Pharaoh that died on the 17th of March, 1450? Because according to the Bible, Pharaoh must have died in the Red Sea. And the answer is yes. And who was that Pharaoh? Well, it was Tutmosis III who died on the 17th of March, 450, according to the biography of his scribe, Amenap. So both the Egyptian chronology and the biblical chronology link a certain time to a death of a pharaoh. Now, who was Tutmosis III? Do you know what? Tutmosis III was the mightiest pharaoh that ever lived. He was the mightiest pharaoh that ever lived. He was known as the Napoleon of Egypt, the greatest conqueror of all times. Not only was Tutmosis III the greatest pharaoh militarily, politically, but also religiously, because he was raised as a child, not in Pharaoh's house, but by the priesthood of Amun. He was a Amun priest. That's very interesting. He was a goat worshipper, in other words. And not only that, Tutmosis III is attributed with the writing of the Book of the Dead. Now, isn't that fascinating? That's the equivalent of the occult Bible. That is the equivalent of the occult Bible. And occultists today adhere to those writings. Fascinating. So here we have a high religious figure and a high political figure who also claimed to be God, ruling upon this earth. And do you think the God of the universe would take a wimp pharaoh to challenge him? Or would this sort of fit into the picture? Let's have a look at the 18th dynasty. That's the dynasty where this famous pharaoh was present. Amorza, the moon is born, 1570 to 1553. Now, that's too late, or too early at least, because uh, remember, Moses came after that time. Then we have Amenhotep, 1553 to 1532. Amun is pleased. That's also before the time. Then we have an interesting pharaoh, who is Tutmosis I. And he ruled from 1532, there's that date, to 1508 BC. Now, Moses was born in this time. And his brother Aaron was born in that time because his brother Aaron was three years older than he was. So, Aaron escaped the death decree by Pharaoh but in this time over here, Tutmosis, the first time, this death decree went out. Tutmosis had a daughter who was called Hatshepsut. This is fascinating. The Bible tells us that Pharaohs who found Moses? 
Pharaoh's daughter. By the way, if you'd watch that film, Moses, you will find that in that film called Moses, it is not the daughter of Pharaoh that found Moses in the river. Anybody pick that up here? Who found it? It was the wife of, of Pharaoh that found Moses in the water. Now that's interesting. You see, that's not the story of the Bible, but that story you will find in another religious book which is called the Quran. Why would they take the story of the Quran rather than the story of the Bible? Would that puzzle you? It's an interesting puzzle. Oh, we can solve that as we go on with the lectures, but nevertheless, it's an interesting story. So Tutmosis I, the father of Hatshepsut, and then comes Tutmosis II, he was the next one. Now, he was the husband of Hatshepsut. So when Tutmosis I died, and Hatshepsut was his daughter, then Moses must have been a young boy in the court of Pharaoh when he died. So theoretically, if he was adopted, he could have become Pharaoh then. Tutmosis II was the husband of Hatshepsut, so Moses obviously didn't take that position. The Bible says Moses was offered the position of Pharaoh, but he refused. There was an opportunity. Then the husband of Hatshepsut took over as Pharaoh, and when he died, because he ruled only four years, you see that? Only four years. Then there was a crisis. Somebody else had to rule. Who ruled after him? Well, the interesting thing is, is that Hatshepsut herself ruled. Here was a female Pharaoh. Now, female Pharaohs weren't allowed because Pharaoh was a reincarnation of the god Osiris, who was male. So you could only become a pharaoh if you were a male. So how did Hatshepsut become a male? Well, yes, she had to become a male. And so Hatshepsut is depicted with a beard, and she became an honorary male. That's very interesting. Do we have societies, I see you are smiling, do we have societies today that wield tremendous power where it is an all-male fraternity, but females can achieve high positions and are then called brother and not sister anymore? Do we have fraternities like that? Oh yes, we certainly have. And they rule the world. And in fact, the rulers of the world belong to that fraternity. Isn't that fascinating? Would you like to hear more about that? Then you'd better come to these lectures because we're going to reveal it. I will show you brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so who's really sister so-and-so and sister so-and-so. That could be interesting. Hmm. But Hatshepsut, of course, was married to this pharaoh over here, Tutmosis II, and obviously they couldn't have children. That's why she probably hungered for a child. She hungered for a child, but she couldn't get one. So Tutmosis II, he was not a very faithful husband. He took his affections elsewhere, and he had a son, an illegitimate son, who was not part of the court. In fact, he was raised outside the court by the priesthood. Who do you think that was? That was the famous Tutmosis III. And this young man had grown up amongst the priesthood, high, among the high priests, and here was the prime candidate for the god Amun. And here was something else happening at the court. And so, when Tutmosis II died, Hatshepsut took over, but she had to co-rule with Tutmosis III, the illegitimate son of Tutmosis II. You know what's fascinating? She was the principal power. She held the reins of power. And then over time, slowly there came a shift. And a few years before her death, suddenly all record boom, of Hatshepsut ceases in the Egyptian chronologies. No record of Hatshepsut. Did you know that all her statues were defaced? 
All her busts were taken, holes were dug, and they were thrown in and buried up. It is as if Egypt wanted to erase the history of Hatshepsut from the history books. Only archaeology has again discovered it. There was a tremendous battle going on over here in the time of Tut Moses III. Well, the next pharaoh then was Amenhotep II. He was the son of uh, Tut Moses III. Notice how the names changed between Tut Moses and Amenhotep. Amenhotep means Amun is pleased, this goat god. Amun is pleased. Tut Moses IV was then the second born son of Amenhotep. We'll get to those in a moment. Fine. There is the famous Hatshepsut. One of the few uh, busts that we have of her, this one comes from the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, Hatshepsut, with an honorary beard. There's another one that was found and dug up, buried somewhere in a hole of Hatshepsut, and here is the famous bust of Tut Moses III. Now I would like you to drink these two pharaohs in. The one, a female, an honorary male, in order to be pharaoh, and the other one, the most powerful pharaoh that ever lived. When Hatshepsut died, he blossomed. He rose like a mushroom. He became not only the political leader of the world, he became the religious leader of the world. Do you know what's interesting? That the occult world today traces its power to that man. Fascinating. Here he is depicted holding the whole army of the Assyrians by, by of the Syrians and Assyrians by the scruff of the hair while he's trampling across their soldiers. You see, the whole army is nothing compared to him. Well, are we on the track? Well, here's a, a substitute article that was made by Time magazine, then you have Hatshepsut over there, one of the few women to rule Egypt, Tut Moses, under his rule Egypt reached the height of its power. I'm not making this up, this is a fact. And then we have some other interesting pharaohs we'll come to in a moment, Akhenaten and so on. Amun, here's a priestess of Amun. Amun worship was associated with quite a lot of licentiousness. Hmm. There was some strange going on. It was a form of a sex cult. Well, do you think it's dead today? Do you think it's dead? I don't think so. It's alive and well and thriving in your country. Did you know that? And only the highest of the highest belong to the fraternity. That's interesting. We'll come to that in a moment. The Amarna period. What is this Amarna period? After the time of Tut Moses III, this mighty pharaoh, comes a time period in Egypt which is known as the Amarna period. And the pharaoh that is worshipping there in that period is Amenhotep III. So here we find a shift from Amun worship to another form of worship which is known as Atenism. Amenhotep IV, the next pharaoh, changes his name later to Akhenaten, and we'll talk about him in a little way. Notice that the name is now no longer Amenhotep, Amun is pleased, but is now Ake, Aten. Aten is another god. Here's a change in the religion of Egypt. Fascinating stuff. Egypt changed its religion. And then comes another pharaoh who is known as Tutankhaten. And he also has this Aten attached to it, but he changes his name back to Tutankhamun. So what happened here? There was a religious change. So here was a brief period in the history of Egypt when pharaohs changed their religion from Amun worship to Aten worship, 
and then from Aten worship back to Amun worship. There was a war. There was a religious war in Egypt. Did you know that? Fascinating stuff. So let's have a look at this famous story. This is Deir el Bari. This is the famous mortuary temple of the famous female pharaoh, Hatshepsut. And over here, you're looking at the ruins of what once used to be the university where Moses was probably trained. This is it, an amazing structure. That is what is left of it. When you go to it, you will see that the figure of Hatshepsut has been whacked off the wall, destroyed, gone. You will find only the emblems of ancient pagan worship left at this temple. Everything else has been destroyed as if a part of religious history had to be rubbed out of Egypt. Here you have a statue, not of Hatshepsut, this is Hathor. This is the famous bull. And I want to take you at Luxor into this tomb over here. I'll take you right in there. And here is a famous uh, sculpture, if you like, where you have the ancient deities. Uh, here you have Horus, and they are honoring this pharaoh. But notice that this chair, pharaoh has been chiseled off the wall. Who was there originally? Well, it has been discovered that who was there originally was none other than Hatshepsut. So she was also <coughs> wiped out as an honored pharaoh of that time. There's the only emblem still remaining of her is a stella of her and of her rival. These two so-called needles at this time. Here is the tomb of the famous Tutmosis III, which is not discovered too long ago. They really searched long for this one high up in the mountains. In you go into this tomb, and you have to walk very high to get there. And there's something else that's interesting about this pharaoh. He is a mummy in the museum of Tutmosis III. Now, what does the Bible say what happened to Tutmosis III? He drowned and he died. And he was probably covered, <laughs> lost at sea and never was found. But here's a mummy. Now, Pharaoh, Tutmosis III, when he died, was approximately the same age as Moses was at that time. So how old was this man about? He must have been 80 years old. But guess what? This mummy was studied by two scientists known as Harris and Weeks, and they came to the conclusion that this mummy was not the mummy of an old man, but of a man in his 20s. So he has a fake mummy. Is it possible that the Egyptians didn't have a body and then took one of the servants, if you like, embalmed him and put him in his place so that if posterity should search, they would have something to find. It's a fake mummy. It cannot be Tutmosis III. If you go into this tomb, you will see, here is the inscription of what it says over there, and it says, he ruled Egypt from 1504 to 1450, the exact date of the Exodus, according to the Book of Kings. Fascinating stuff. Well, Pharaoh... What else have you got hidden in your tomb? Let's go inside. Here you have worship of the scarab beetle. And then all you have, for a sudden you have this. Here's a priest of Horus throwing his staff and it turns into a serpent. Interesting. Where do we read something like that? Only in the Bible. Do we hear of the priests of Horus throwing their staffs? and they turned into serpents. But the Bible says that the staff of Moses ate them all up. Isn't that fascinating that we would find this in the tomb with bowing down worshippers to the serpent, serpent worship? Here are parts of the Book of the Dead written by Tutmosis III, and here is Pharaoh himself with a serpent in front of him. This is exactly what is described in the Bible. Here is the tomb of Amenhotep II. Fascinating stuff. One of the followers, the subsequent rulers. Let's have a look at this man. Amenhotep II was the son of Tutmosis III. Now the Bible says that all the firstborn in Egypt died, but this man wasn't in Egypt at the time. 
He had the army of Egypt, and he was suppressing an uprising in Syro-Palestine. And the Bible says that Pharaoh died. But the Pharaoh that died was Tutmosis III. His son wasn't in Egypt. But his children were in Egypt. So all the firstborn that were in Egypt died. So what would have happened to the young Pharaoh or heir to the throne that was still in Egypt? He would have had to die as well. Here's another part of the Book of the Dead in that famous uh, tomb. Here we have Amenhotep II's tomb. And here you have a statue at Luxor of Amenhotep II with an inscription, All is well in my kingdom. All is at rest. Why would they write something like that? Were they trying to cover up something? You see, isn't it interesting that when this pharaoh returned from Syro-Palestine, after having suppressed an uprising, you would imagine there would be joy in Egypt, right or wrong. But not him. He was furious when he came back. Did you know that he went on a rampage through his own country, destroying and killing thousands, and then also chopping off the heads of people, attaching them to his boat and sailing up the Nile with them? He totally smashed everything in Egypt. He went on a fit of rage. How would you feel if your soldiers returned from Iraq and smashed the United States? Would you be very impressed with them? Well, that's what this pharaoh did. And then he has the gall to say, all is well in my kingdom, all is at rest. Perhaps nothing was well in Egypt. Here's another clue. Here's the Sphinx. And there's a little stella between the legs of the Sphinx. There it is. And it has a strange inscription on it. It says... Pharaoh, or the next Pharaoh now, which is now Tut Moses IV. Remember, Tut Moses III was the mighty Pharaoh. His son, Amenhotep II, wasn't there. He came back and destroyed Egypt. His son, his children were obviously in Egypt at the time of the plagues. So his firstborn would have died. And now the secondborn would be the next Pharaoh. But how do they explain that to posterity? Because obviously the firstborn had to be Pharaoh. So here, this is how they explain it. On the stella over there, it says the following. Hey, Tutmosis IV, I know that you are the second-born son of Amenhotep, but there's so much dust between my legs over here. If you remove the, the dust, I will make you, the second-born, the next pharaoh. And he did it, and that's why he's pharaoh. Do you believe it? Do you believe that the second born became the pharaoh because he took the dust from between the legs of the, the sphinx? Or do you think the second born became the pharaoh because the first born was dead? So let's look at Sherlock Holmes here. A change of religion. The mighty pharaoh Tut Moses dies on the day of the flood of the, of the exodus and this, not flood, but this destruction in the Red Sea. Not only that, there is no body for him and there's a fake young fellow over there. Then, a second born reigns instead of a first born. Here is the tomb of Tutmosis IV. That's what it looks like. Here you have the famous chamber in which they have the deities protecting his, his entrails. And then his son is Amenhotep III. He's still Amun worship, but this pharaoh started changing his religion. And all of a sudden, he was not so popular anymore. Amenhotep III had a problem, and so, boom! His statues were also chiseled off the walls. And then comes another pharaoh. He was supposed to be an Amenhotep IV, but he decides, I don't want to be Amenhotep IV, I'll change my name to Akhenaten. There he is. Pharaoh Akhenaten. And guess what? All of a sudden, Egypt changes as though transformed. Whereas pharaohs were always mightier than mighty, women were down lower than the knee, this pharaoh changes. And he says, no longer, you sculpt me like I am. I have a pot belly, you give me one. I'm no beaut, you make me no butte. And as for my wife and my children, you give them the position they deserve. 
Atonism is displayed by these sun rays, but the, it is not sun worship. There's another deity that is worshipped. All of this royal family was murdered, except a few. Very interesting story. All their reliefs, their statues were smashed. Here he is with his wife giving her a kiss. Wow, she's not knee high, she's all of a sudden kiss high. Isn't that interesting? Anybody know what his wife's name was? Nefertiti. Nefertiti. And they had six daughters. And one of the daughters' names was Ankensenpaten. Please note that it ends in Aten. Fascinating stuff. He takes the whole capital, which was steeped in pagan religion, rips it up, says, I'm moving elsewhere, moves the capital to the opposite side of the Nile, higher up, and calls it Aketaten. So Akenaten, Aketaten, his daughter, Ankensempaten. Everything ends in Aten. There's a new god reigning. And then a great intrigue takes place. Here's a famous relief of them. There is Akhenaten kissing his little baby kid children. There is Nefertiti sitting with a little child on her lap. Realism comes to Egypt, the famous Nefertiti. Those are the only reliefs that are left. Now, did you know that this whole royal family was destroyed? But there was a love affair in that family. And the love affair was between one of the daughters of Akhenaten, who was known as Ankensempaten, and she married a young man over here who was known as Tutankaten. Tutankaten. But he changed his name. He changed his name to Tutankhamun, the famous Tutankhamun. So is it possible that he changed his religion? And what religion did they have? Did you know that Akhenaten wrote a poem to his God and that he quotes a psalm of Moses verbatim? Isn't that interesting? So which God did he begin to serve? Is it possible that he served the God of Moses? I think he did. And a war broke out. And there was an old Amun priest who was a traitor. And he was actually a worshipper of Amun, but he pretended to be a worshipper of Aten, an old man of 80 years old, an old goat. Now in those days, 80 years was not as bad as it is today. Moses became 120 years old. The average age of his family was about 120 years old. We've been declining since then. But 80 was an old goat. And he had the entire family murdered, including Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun was murdered by his head being crushed in at the back. And then she, in desperation, wrote a letter to the king of the Hittites and said, please send me a husband or I die. And the king of the Hittites wrote back and said, get lost. And guess who married her? this old 80-year-old lecherous priest, and he became Pharaoh, and the religion switched back to Amun. You know what? Religious infiltration by liars is just as common today as it was in that day. Religious intrigue and political intrigue go hand in hand. And so this young Tutankhamun, who sold his soul by changing back to Amun, lost everything in any case. And he's depicted, buried in great wealth and gold and all of these things. But here is his famous uh, throne. He had two thrones, one of Aten, one of Amun. The symbolism that we have in Egypt is the same symbolism that we use in the world today. Here you have the uh, chamber with the four female deities over there protecting his entrails because they put his entrails in a bottle. These are all the ancient gods. Here are two statues, when you go to Luxor, of these pharaohs and his wife. This over here is none other than Tutankhamun. And this one over here 
is Ankensen Amun. How sad. Her name wasn't Ankensen Amun. Her name used to be Ankensen Paten. But she changed her religion. Why? To stay alive, number one, and to receive honor and glory and earthly fame. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. The Hittite cities, you know the higher critics said there were no Hittites until they found letters of Hittite kings telling Egypt to get lost. You know the Ebla tablets that were found? Thousands of tablets found at Ebla which mention Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham, Isaac, all of the biblical figures. Never ever had they been known before except here. Do you know what? I believe the Exodus took place exactly like it says. And Egypt covered up the story and waited till Ramesses were there when Amun worship was then well established again so that people wouldn't pick up a hiccup in the history. I think the Bible is right and the Egyptian hieroglyphics are lying. That's what I believe. Scandal of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here they found books of the Bible in these jars, every single book of the Bible except the book of Esther. And what has happened? The Bible has been vindicated as unchanged. All these great critics that want to prove the Bible wrong, they will find that it is not so. So, I believe that whatever it says in the Bible historically is a fact. And it is vindicated by hieroglyphics and by cuneiform writings. On the tablets of the world, we find so much information that we find nowhere else other than in the Bible. For example, the characters in the book of Daniel, they said they never existed, Belshazzar never existed as a king until they found a tablet where it says Belshazzar. So the Bible is historically correct. Now what about the prophetic aspect? Let me take you to Tyre. Tyre is a fascinating city, and here are remnants of Tyre, it was the Phoenician city. Here are the Phoenicians, these great traders and seafarers. And ancient Tyre no longer exists. In fact, when you look out over the sea, ancient Tyre is in the sea. There it is. There it lies. Now, what does the Bible say about Tyre? Here are pillars of Tyre lying in the sea, strewn on the beach. And here you have a remnant of not ancient Tyre, but of a new Tyre that was built on an island. And what is the story of the Bible there? Well, here is an old tomb. Maybe the person who lived in that tomb had the story to tell. Interesting, there you have the ancient goddesses of the seas, the Medusas of the Greek period. Here I'm talking to a man who uh, sitting there on this famous spot of history and uh, interesting reliefs of grapes and all kinds of interesting things. This is modern Tyre. Now let's see what a prophet said. Ezekiel 26, 3 and 4. Behold, I will cause many nations to come up against thee and they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. That's fair enough. Big deal. Any prophet could prophesy that an ancient city would be destroyed at some time, you might say. What was the worship of Tyre? It was sun worship. There you have the famous uh, eight-pointed star, two basic crosses within one another. It was the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. The priests of Dagon had the fish head on their heads, and they were worshipped as deities. Ezekiel continues to say, I will scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. I sh it shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. Well, that's a bit different. What else does the prophet have to say? What is this part of the city that we see here today, an ancient tire sticking out there in the sea? Ezekiel 26 verse 12, And they shall plunder your riches and make a prey of your merchandise, and they shall break down your walls and destroy your desirable houses, and they shall lay your stones and your timber and your dust in the midst of the water. Now that's a bit different. What if a prophet came and prophesied this about your city, that the whole city will end up in the water? That would be slightly different. Verse 14 says, I will make you like a shining rock. You shall be the place 
for the spreading of nets on you shall be built no more. That's an interesting prophecy. For I, the Lord, have spoken, says the Lord Jehovah. So God says, I will destroy this city. I will take the city and I will throw it into the sea and it will never be built again. It should be easy to prove it wrong, but it hasn't been proved wrong. It'll be a place where fishermen do their thing in the city. Well, here is a fisherman standing in ancient Tyre fishing. Isn't that interesting? He's a fulfillment of prophecy. I say, well, isn't that great? I'll photograph you. You are a fulfillment of prophecy. Here's another fisherman gathering worms in ancient Tyre here in the ocean, ready to do his fishing. Well, that prophecy stood for a quarter of a millennium until this man came along, Alexander the Great, and he had a problem. Ancient Tyre had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and it lay there in ruins, defying the prophet's words for a quarter of a millennium. Nebuchadnezzar had flattened ancient Tyre, but the Phoenicians were seafarers. They escaped to an island not too far off, and they built a new Tyre. And there they flourished on the island in their new Tyre, while the ancient city lay on the shore. Then Alexander came along, and he tried to conquer modern Tyre. He sent out his ships, but these guys were clever. They put posts under the sea, much as we would plant mines, and he didn't know the way through, and his ships were destroyed one after the other, and he was furious. He couldn't conquer them. And one day he was looking around. Alexander was a very determined man, and what did he see? He saw this huge pile of rubble of ancient Tyre, and he said to his soldiers, if I cannot get them with ships, do you see that rubble lying over there? Throw it into the ocean and build me a highway to the island. That's what they did. And then when they'd thrown it in, it was pretty bumpy to take the carts and the things over. So what did they do? They scraped the dust together and filled it in. They took the earth of Tyre and filled it in, and they built a highway in the sea. The whole of the city was Tyre, was thrown into the midst of the sea, including the dust. Isn't that a fulfillment of prophecy? Wow! And so over the years, ancient Tyre, the city, became part of the mainland as it was silted in. So what we see today is not the ancient city of Tyre. We see the modern one silted in, and the ancient one is in the sea. Here is Maya's ancient history. Alexander the Great, after a most memorable siege, captured the city of Tyre and reduced it to ruins, B.C. 332. She never recovered from the blow. The larger part of the site is of the once great city is now as bare as the top of a rock, a place where fishermen who still frequent the spot spread their nets to dry. Biblical prophecy fulfilled to the letter, defying God's words for 250 years, but then being fulfilled. Now, if ancient prophecy is so accurately fulfilled, how much more so modern prophecy? Cannot we trust the Bible in terms of its prophetic word? Yeah, you can find snippets of Tyre. God says, remember the former things from forever, for I am God and no other God there is, even none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the past things were not done, saying, my purpose shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Don't mess with God. One final aspect I want to bring out in the archaeology is this famous story of a city hewn in stone, Petra. The Bible tells the story of a city hewn out of solid rock. Of course, the higher critics had a great deal of fun with that. Oh, there is no city that was hewn out of solid rock. doesn't exist. Petra means rock. Well, then, when was it discovered? Right down in our modern times. The archaeologist that discovered it disguised himself as a Bedouin sheikh, and he defined it. Abadiah 1, verse 2 and 4 says, The Lord says to Edom, the Edomites were the descendants of Esau, I will make you weak, everyone will despise you, your pride has deceived you, your capital is a fortress of solid rock, and so you say to yourself, who can pull me down, even though you make your home as high as an eagle's nest so that it seems to be among the stars, yet I will pull you down. Fortress of solid rock. 
Oh, what rubbish, said the higher critics. Well, Petra rock exists, but you couldn't find it easily because you have to go through this narrow channel which is called a sik. So you can walk through it touching it like this. So it was difficult to get to. It was impossible to conquer. So how was it brought down? It was brought down by economic decay. The trade routes shifted. Let me take you there. As you walk through these channels, the first glimpse of the city is that building over there. As you walk along this walkway, sometimes it widens, sometimes it narrows. There must have been fantastic sculptures on the side. Here was obviously a camel with a man leading it. The feet of the camel are still there. The rest is eroded away and uh, the sculpture is gone. Beautiful pictures that you can take of the ancient shrines. As you come through the narrow sick, that's the first structure you see, the beautiful El Kazna Temple. Magnificent. There used to be a legend that the gold of Egypt was in that dome. Of course, they found nothing in there. But the difference between this and any other city is that it is hewn out of solid rock. This is not a building. It is chiseled out of the rock. Isn't that fantastic? Every single thing over there. And along the walls over here, when you were rich, you got a tomb. And those were your tombs hewn out of solid rock as well. Famous tombs of important people all along the side. This was a house. All the houses were hewn out of solid rock. So this is how the people lived. And here is the famous amphitheater. And if you look above the amphitheater, there were the tombs. Because when you were dead, you wanted something to watch, to entertain you, you see. So this was a good place to be buried. If you had the money, you could buy the prime seats at the back and look at whatever transpired there while you were dead. You see, there are the tombs up there, and here's the amphitheater. I don't know whether the, the patrons came with a clothes peg, but uh, anyway, that must have been what it was like. The amphitheater, as it was, with its entering channels and whatever, this is where everything took place, the stage. The Bible says that this city would never be inhabited again. When it isn't, it's totally uninhabited. The only people you will find there are tour guides. Here's one of them on his camel. That's the picture of the wall you didn't have to paint there. Very beautiful rocks. Your pride has deceived you. No one fears you as much as you think you do. You live on the rocky cliffs high on top of a mountain. But even though you live as high as an eagle, the Lord will bring you down. The Lord has spoken. The destruction that will come on Edom will be so terrible that everyone who passes by will be shocked and terrified. No one will ever live there again. I, the Lord, have spoken. Easy to throw that prophecy over. Hasn't been done to this day. God said it through the prophet Jeremiah. Well, that is the case. Why would God want to destroy that culture? Well, here's a clue. Up there, high on the mountain, is a stella. Remember? One of those things that you saw in Egypt. And it was a high place. God had instructed the children of Israel to destroy the high places. But what happened on the high places? Here are the steps that lead up to the high place. And what is interesting is that on many high places, of course this was a place of offering, but on many of the high places there were human sacrifices. God was to be appeased by the sacrifice of a human. Fascinating. And normally it was a young woman that was sacrificed. The sacrifice of young women was part of the religions of South America. And in the occult world today, whoo, interesting things are happening. Well, let's go and take a walk up this high place. This is the best preserved high place in the world. As you climb higher and higher and higher, you get to, get to see a beautiful view of Petra. Slowly you get to see the stella more and more. Here's the sign which says a sacrificial high place. But when you get to the top, you actually see two stellas. There's one, and there's the other one. The one is called Dushara, and the other one is called El Uza. Now, what do they signify? Here we are at the stella. 
And interestingly enough, there's my friend sitting there, and I'm peeping behind this one over here. When there were two shots, there was something interesting about it. It depicted the male and the female aspect of the deity. That's why in Egypt, they left those two stellas next to each other, one depicting a male and the other one depicting a female. They left it there for esoteric reasons in Luxor, but here you still have two pillars on this high place. Here's a place of ritual washing, where there was holy water and they washed themselves. Here's the actual sacrificial place. And uh, if you look across here, you'll see some interesting design features over here. The animal sacrifices took place. And here was a place for cutting up uh, the carcasses. But in human sacrifices, the young girl was placed over there. Here is a place where they used to put the heart. They would take the heart out alive of the animal or the human and place it in there. And the blood would trickle down over there and uh, would end up in the wash basins over here. This was a place for ritual washing of carcasses. And if you look across, there's an interesting stella over there, that white one over there. Now that is a marker of the grave of Aaron, according to tradition, that is. Interesting. Two religions meet over here. The one, the high priest of of the Hebrew religion, Aaron being buried over here, and here another high place. And uh, this is this famous solar disk where the heart was placed. Terrible occurrence. They would wait, tear open the, the chest, take the heart out while it was still pumping, place it in there, and watch the blood trickle down into the holy water, and when it entered the water, the sun god was appeased of his wrath. Uh, we made a little video up there where I explained some of the features that you can see. This is the sacrificial high place here at Petra. Here they would place the heart of the human sacrifice and the blood would trickle down the groove. And over here they would burn the body. We have the two sun pillars representing Dushara and Al Uzza. And as the sun rose in the morning and struck the top of the pillar, the sacrifice was made. Wherever we have obelisks, like we have over here, the archaeology tells us that there were human sacrifices, just as we find at Gezer in Israel, where they found the actual bodies of adults, even small children, that were sacrificed to the sun god. If you look across this valley, you can see a white stone which marks the place where Aaron is buried. And it is interesting that you have these two religions meeting in this spot. The one which requires a human sacrifice of a virgin to appease the sun god, and the other one which relies on the Lamb of God, which was sacrificed for the sins of the world. You see, these two religious systems have been clashing since the dawn of man. Let's go down from there and see if we can glean some more information as we walk down, come across this famous Tomb of the Tears where the rock formation has changed and uh, Bedouins all over the place trying to sell their wares to you. This is the famous Lion Fountain. Here was a fountain over here depicted by a lion and the building that you see here is one of the constructed buildings. Of course, besides having hewn things out of the rock, there were also constructed buildings. And this one over here was the famous Temple of Isis. So Isis, Osiris worship, and the sacrifice of humans to appease the god, and humans were gods themselves, that was the religion of that time. It was a pantheistic religion. And also very interesting, over here we find the symbols of the lion with the eagle's wings. Now we'll be dealing with a lecture of Daniel chapter 7 where we will see that the Babylonian Empire was represented in the Bible as a lion with eagle's wings. Well, there you have it. It's not a joke. The Bible knows exactly which symbols to use and only the archaeological tools of today have revealed these things. Amazing. Two camels, 
They have nothing to do with the lecture. I just love camels. They're so cutely ugly. My friend had to climb up the other side as well because then we went on to another mountain on the other side. And when you climb that many mountains in a day, well, you get pretty tired. So he took a donkey and I walked and I just photographed some faces along the road thinking how sad that the whole world doesn't know about salvation in Jesus Christ. As we come up the other side, there's another temple that looks just like the al -Khazna. It's a big one. It's huge. There it is. And uh, what tomb is this? And what is uh, represented over here? Now, according to tradition, again, another famous biblical person is buried over here. And I guess, you won't guess who this is. It's Miriam, the sister of Moses. So according to tradition, this place over here marks her burial place. It's huge. I'm leaning against the pillar there to show you what sizes we are dealing with. It's absolutely huge, and it's hewn out of solid rock. Isn't it fascinating that these ancient pagan religions honor very often the very personages of the Bible while they deny, deny the veracity and the power of the Bible? Isn't that fascinating? Isn't it interesting that if you go, for example, into uh, one of the great mosques in Syria, in Damascus, when you enter into that, there's a huge shrine over there where they worship at the body of one of the biblical figures in Islam, where they worship and they say the head of John the Baptist is buried there. And here, an ancient pagan religion made a religious symbol of Miriam. Isn't that interesting? Do you know that wherever you go in the Middle East, you find the tombs of the great biblical figures honored? Even the prophets, they're honored. They build tombs for them and all kinds of things. Didn't Jesus complain about that? Didn't he say to them, you build the tombs of the prophets, but you're just as guilty of stoning them? Didn't he say that? It's fascinating stuff. You see, you can get at God in two ways. The first way of getting at God is to not believe what his prophets say. So when his prophets walk around on the earth, you ignore them, you hate them, eventually you stone them and kill them. And then once they're dead, what do you do? You build giant tombs for them and you honor the place where they are. And people come and pray at the feet of the tomb and honor the prophet. Hello? Who's supposed to receive our worship? God or the prophets? God. You're dishonoring God twice. If you pray to a human to save you, if you were to pray to Abraham, help me, or whoever, help me, and you leave God out of the picture, that's dishonoring God. Not listening to his prophets is dishonoring him as well. The prophets were humans like you and I. They serve God and they will receive their reward in heaven. They will be honored in heaven. But they are not God that we could pray to them. Pray to God, to no one else. You, you dishonor God twice by praying to his prophets or by disrespecting his prophets. Beautiful places, and it seems strange that there should be such a hue and cry. As we come down the other side, some interesting features as we look through from some of these buildings, many of which had religious connotations, one of the things you will always find is three arches. And the center one is normally somewhat larger than the side arches. But three arches is very common in religious worship because they had three deities. They would put the father figure, the mother, and the child on all three of them. So father, mother, child worship. Very prominent in ancient religions. Do you think it's dead today? Or do you think it might be alive and well and thriving in the greatest religions of the world to this very day? The Bible says, let not your hearts be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. That's the story of God in the Bible. Do we need an earthly rock to keep us safe from our enemies? Or is it better to have a heavenly rock to stand firmly rooted on? The world today ridicules the Bible. The world ridicules the creation account. The whole scientific world is bent against the creation account. We dishonor God more today than in any other time in the history of mankind. Did you know that? We dishonor God by what we do and what we claim. That we are the sole ones responsible for what we do to ourselves and how we live our lives. No, we have a responsibility towards God. We dishonor God by not believing His word. We dishonor God by praying and making deities of so many things when there is a God in heaven who says, look, I tell you the former things so that when these things happen, then I'll tell you the future things so that when they happen, you may believe. We serve a God who loves us. Believe in God. Believe also in His Son. And He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He's believable. I go to prepare a place for you. I want you to be where I am also. Ancient Israel had to sacrifice a lamb. It was a painful experience. It was an object lesson. The lamb stood for something higher. And when John the Baptist beheld Jesus Christ, he said, Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. You see, God himself was to be the sacrifice. But man says, no, I don't need you. I'll do it my way. And our way is not the way that leads to salvation. Only God's way leads to salvation. Because salvation is a free gift from God. It's not something I can earn. Two religious systems are clashing. And they will clash in the world that we live in right now more than you might imagine more than you might imagine. And the great stories of the Bible of the past are lesson books to educate our minds as to what's happening in the present. So in the lectures that are coming now, come and listen. We will start opening up the books of prophecy and we will see that what is transpiring now has been told, foretold in the Bible. It is a horrendous story but it is a story which shows the mighty power of God. So come again. Don't stay away. And may God bless you as you ponder these things. Thank you.
Thank you.